Hello, I'm Matt McLaughlin, and thank you for joining me for this very special Remembrance Day event. After the trauma of the last couple of years with COVID, it's wonderful to see that Australians are back visiting the battlefields and walking the ground where the Anzac legend was forged. Personally, I've just come back from the battlefields on my Western Front signature tour, and it was wonderful to be over there, seeing the people, seeing those gravestones, walking those battlefields, sacred sites where Australians achieved so much on the battlefields. And it was fascinating to be back on the Western Front because, of course, that's where Remembrance Day first began. Remembrance Day was originally known as Armistice Day and commemorated the end of the First World War when the guns fell silent on November 11, 1918. But since then, the nature of the day has changed because, sadly, we've had many more conflicts. And today, Remembrance Day, as it's now known, commemorates all men and women who've served in uniform and particularly those who died in combat for Australia. So it means a lot of different things to people all around the world. And what I wanted to do today was speak to some of those people, bring you some of these stories from all corners of the globe and talk about what Remembrance Day means in significant battle sites all over the world. So join me now as we cross to Turkey to speak to our wonderful Gallipoli historian, Craig Roach. Craig, thanks very much for joining us from Turkey. Thanks, Matt. It's always a pleasure to see you. See you, mate. We can tell from your accent that you're an Aussie. How did you? Uh, how did you find yourself to be living in Turkey and guiding the battlefields of Gallipoli? Uh, well, to cut a long story short, hi- history has always been my thing. And uh, or back in the early '80s, uh, uh, backpacking around the the world, we we uh, we decided to start sleeping in ancient sites, uh, usually illegally. And so we we found our way uh, through ancient sites in Egypt and Europe and Scotland and and even America, and uh, finally found our way to Turkey. And uh, my first Anzac experience was. Uh, it was two weeks camping in the in the forest uh, at Mimosa uh, at the on the edge of the battlefield, and uh, that was under my skin from there on. I couldn't leave it. So, how long have you been in Turkey for now, mate? Uh, off and on since nineteen eighty four, and uh, permanently since about ninety five, ninety six. And you're at uh, you're just down the road from Gallipoli. You don't live on the battlefield, but you're not far away, are you? No, because I've got an office in Istanbul, which uh, I've visited once in three years due to COVID. Uh, and uh, I'm in Tekadar, which is halfway between Istanbul and and the battlefield. Well, we get lots of rave reports made about you whenever you guide our Australian guests around, so you certainly are a Gallipoli expert. Before we talk about the battlefields specifically, just tell us about Turkey. It must be a wonderful place to live, and it's also a very popular destination with tourists for attractions beyond just the battlefields. So what's it like as a country and as a destination? It's 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 just wonderful. I mean, it just oozes uh, history. You know, somebody told me many years ago that you could... You could stand in any place in Turkey and never be further than 10 kilometres from a, a major historical site. And that's what it's like. You know, it's just we're just surrounded by uh, ancient Greek, Persian, Thracian uh, history everywhere. It's just, it's just amazing. Yeah, and, and if you're a history buff, it's just the, the best thing in the world. One of my highlights of visiting Turkey, Rochi, is always connecting with the local people because, firstly, they're a very lovely people, but also there's a very strong connection with Australian and New Zealand history because of Gallipoli. Is that is that something you find as a local living in Turkey? Oh, absolutely. And, and to 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 bring it down a little bit, I mean, the, the the locals who have made Gallipoli their life and their life's work, you know, the local guides, uh, the local organisations, uh, the people in general, they've all got a they've all got a Gallipoli story in them in themselves. Uh, I'm I'm trying to document a, a few of the Turkish stories of their their grandfathers or their great grandfathers or their great uncles who walked off farms to uh, to defend their country back in 1915. 
but they're but they're wonderful people. They really are. You know, I've, I've been a I've, I got married to a lovely Turkish lady uh, many years ago, and uh, my daughter is is half Australian, half Turkish. Uh, so she has a foot in each culture, and she she loves her Aussie Aussie cousins, and she uh, and she loves being in Turkey. She's and. And being my daughter as well, she's always surrounded with history and we're exploring old sites and uh, uh, she's found many a bone in Gallipoli herself and, you know, many a pottery shard in uh, Troy and it's just it's, it's just such a, a unique uh, family experience that we have. Well, let's talk about the Gallipoli battlefield specifically because this is where the Anzac legend began and it's... I mean, what can you say about it, mate, as a destination? It's one of my favourites. The terrain is virtually unchanged. It's 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 a unique battlefield in the world, and I think everyone who visits it gets that immediate sense of connecting with that history. What's it like for you to be guiding people there just about every day of the week and getting to walk that ground all the time? Well, you know, what I deliberately do at the beginning of every tour is is that we don't drive around past the Sphinx. What we do is we would pull up at Araburnu. It's now all overgrown behind behind it, so the, the clients can't see. Uh, I walk them all the way down to the far corner, and then when they turn around, they they see uh, the Sphinx. They see it as it was at four thirty in the morning on the twenty fifth of April, and um, they're, they're just gobsmacked. They just they're in silence. They can't believe it. They they're it takes them a good 10 or 15 seconds to take it in before we can continue talking about Gallipoli, about the battlefield. But it's just an amazing place. I mean, the, on our walking tour in September, we we, we found the, uh, the remains of probably a, a young Kiwi at Hill 60 uh, that has been laying out there in the elements, you know, for 107 years. Um, it, it's a battlefield that never stops giving. I mean, we, you know, we, we, we find bones, we find relics, we find evidence. Uh, it really hasn't changed apart from the fact that nature has won the war. You know, nature is just taking taking everything back. And it's such you a beautiful mate, place. the walking tour. Oh, it's a it's a stunning place, and you mentioned the walking tour. Yeah, what's the importance of walking at a battlefield like Gallipoli rather than just seeing it from your car or from a touring coach? Uh, to feel the, we often say that if, if someone's having a bit of a grizzle walking up Pluggies Plateau or or down uh, uh, Rhododendron Ridge, you know, so look at least at least nobody's shooting at you. And they say, "Oh, yeah, well, I never thought of it that way." And that, that's that, that's how it goes. I mean, you you uh, uh, when I take them up Pluggy's Plateau, I always tell them the story of how Charles Bean walked up the same goat track on the day of the landing, and and when he got to the he got to where the cemetery is, there were twelve men screaming out for water in agony. And uh, as he unhooked his canteen, the, the the local field ambulance guy said, "Look, save your water for the living." So I mean, it, it's it's quite poignant. I mean, they we, we always I always pour a bit of water on one of the twelve graves uh, as a as a as a remembrance, and uh, it, it generally generally invokes a few tears within the group as well. How do people respond to these stories, Rochi? Because you're a bit of a master storyteller and like that one that you just told us, you really can bring this history to life and you're great at picking those elements that really make it a special experience. How, how do people react when they're standing in this place they've heard so much about and, and hearing those stories from you? Well, uh, I, I think that really comes to the fore when I take them to Lone Pine because I, I, I make them look around and I say, look, What's your first impression of this place? And they say, "Yeah, it's beautiful. It's serene. It's symmetrical. It's lovely." I said, "But look, basically, it's a big lie because we're actually standing on the bones of, of the scattered bones of about six thousand men. 
you know, you, you have to understand it. And Charles Bean again, you know, he, he said that um, the day he entered the, the Lone Pine trenches uh, after the second or third day after the Lone, Battle of Lone Pine, uh, you know, the, the dead were four deep. And he had to, he, he said the only respect we could show them was to not walk on their faces. And that really sends a shiver up their spine, and my and me as well. I mean, I, yeah, after thirty odd years, I, I I still choke up a bit when I get to Lone Pine, and it's it's it's, it's the same all through. I mean, I used to walk down, we used to walk down Johnson's Jolly, of course, and I could always tell where they went to the Johnson's Jolly trenches by a, a femur that stuck out of the side of the road, and. Uh, it's not there anymore since they widened the road, but they, uh, it's things like that. It's, you know, finding those bones, finding those, that evidence uh, that, that something really did go on, go on here. Something really happened. And uh, that, 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 that'll keep me till the day I die, I guess, because it's just a, it's just one of those places. You, it just resonates time and time again. It's so true, Rochi, and also the Turkish authorities are doing a wonderful job of, of of clearing some of that scrub back a little bit so that the trenches can be revealed. Yeah, sure. Just more and more facets of Gallipoli being exposed every year, aren't there? Oh, absolutely. And uh, as I know, you were you were uh, you were very excited about the silt spur trenches being cleared, and uh, it's just amazing. And I, I I take people down there on every trip. Uh, to to check out the silt spur trenches, and it was good. I didn't know that much of the history of the silt spur trench system uh, until the walking tour, and uh, and I kind of picked up on the stories of uh, uh, the, the 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 engineer Beige and how he was sent forward to try and peg out the the uh, the, the, the new trenches. And uh, and just the stories of, the, of the, the Turks who were living in the trenches at the time, uh, how they were cleared out, how the, you know, the 9th and the 11th Battalion did all the work and then they handed it over to the 10th Battalion. And uh, just the, those personal stories, you know, the guys, uh, the guys who were sent forward to, to do the, uh, make the tunnels and do, build the saps and how they were, yeah, they're just diggers. They were just local, they were just, Soldiers, you know, they did it all their best when they weren't didn't have a gun in their hand. They wanted to get out of doing as much work as possible. So, just the the, the way that the the ANZAC uh, commanders decide to change that that mindset and bring in engineers and and miners, ex miners, to do the work themselves. Well, it's a wonderful place, Gallipoli. It's very close it really to my is. heart. It's been too long since I've been over there. And Rochi, I can't wait to get back over there with you and, and walk that ground again, mate. It's a very special thing to do. Please do. You know, you're always welcome. There's always a cold beer at hand. Uh, it's it's such a nice place. It, it really is. I mean, and as and I can't, I, yeah. The importance of knowing the the locals are such an important facet of this uh, of what we do here as well. You know, the drivers, our local guides, uh, the authorities. Everybody, the security guards, the whole lot. It's it's safe and it's wonderful. And people, if, if they didn't come with an Anzac story, they certainly go home with one. That's very well said, Rochi. And thank you very much for joining us from Turkey on this Remembrance Day. You're welcome, Matt. And I uh, hope to see you soon. From Gallipoli to France, the place where Remembrance Day perhaps has more significance than anywhere else because this is where the armistice was signed that ended the First World War. This is where Armistice Day comes from. And there's one man who knows these battlefields better than anyone else. I've just come back from touring the battlefields with him for a couple of weeks. It's always a great pleasure to catch up with my dear friend and battlefield historian, Pete Smith. Pete, thanks for joining us from the Somme in northern France. Great to be with you again, Matt. It's pretty important where you are, mate, because you're in the heart of the Western Front battlefields and we're coming to you on Remembrance Day and this is what Remembrance Day is all about, the end of the First World War on the Western Front. So, I mean, what's it like to be sitting there 
in the heart of the battlefields. Well, it's very moving, I have to say. I always uh, have this same uh, feeling when we get round to Remembrance Day. You know, I'm, uh, I'm literally, as you said, in the heart of the battlefields. The, uh, the cemeteries are all around me. So, so a very moving day, Remembrance Day, and one that I enjoy. How did you end up living in France, Pete? Because obviously you're not French. How did you end up uh, leaving the UK and becoming a full-time battlefield guide in the Somme? Yeah, it's almost 20 years ago now uh, that I uh, I arrived here and uh, originally came out to set up a, a bed and breakfast and uh, a small touring business and uh, and the bed and breakfast has gone, uh, thankfully, for anybody that's done bed and breakfasting, it's a fa- fairly tough gig. So uh, we're now uh, just, I, I concentrate on, on battlefield guiding and uh, much, much more rewarding, I have to, I have to say. You spend a lot of your time on the Australian battlefields. Is that uh, an aspect of the history that you really enjoy? Um, yes, it is. Uh, and it came about in a strange way, really. It's due to the, the, the way that Australians book uh, tours, um, normally six months uh, in advance at, at the very least. And so slowly but surely, I've really uh, um, been drawn into the Australian battlefields because when Brits try to, to, to uh, engage me, um, I've already been booked by Australians. So it's, it's been a slow process and one that I've really enjoyed. Well, you're our leading guide on the Western Front and anyone that goes to France from an Australian perspective just talks about how much they they enjoy it. Do you find that French, sorry, do you find that Australian visitors to France are different from UK visitors? Um, a little, but only in the, in the sense that uh, for most Australians, the visit is part of a bigger tour to Europe or, or very often around the world. So... Um, yeah, there is, there is a difference. Uh, there's a difference in the, the distance and that affects how, how, you, how you feel about travelling. So I can normally spot my Australians uh, when I'm, I'm picking Australians up. They tend to be carrying an awful lot more luggage than the average British uh, battlefield uh, tourist or visitor. It must be wonderful to be touring in France. I mean, it's one of the world's great destinations and it's our most popular battlefield destination. I mean, France offers so much more than just battlefields, of course. It must be wonderful to be able to take people around and enjoy the food and the, the culture and the, and the warm welcome from the local people as well. Well, it's one of the things that I really enjoy doing because there's an awful lot of people that uh, that are travelling on these these long tours around the world or around Europe, and they go from tourist location to tourist location. And I really enjoy taking people to the little bars and cafes and actually driving them through the villages as we go from cemetery or memorial to memorial. Um, and it gives people much more of an insight into to the the life in uh, in northern France. Um, so it's something that I've really specialised uh, in doing. And very often I get those questions, not non battlefield related, about what is going on in that village, what the people do for a living, and sometimes even what is that growing in that field. All part of the experience, really, of uh, of of exploring a, a region that people don't know with them. Well, we had that experience only a few weeks ago, Pete, when you and I co-hosted the Matt McLaughlin Signature Tour, and I really did enjoy that. It was wonderful to get your perspective as a local, as someone who lives there. And I think the thing about France is there's probably more tangible reminders of the war than on just about any other battlefield. Uh, What are some of those reminders that you love visiting? Yeah, well, well, to me, um, I suppose the uh, the, the most uh, uh, important and visual aspect of the of the battlefields is, is actually uh, the cemeteries. They are all around us. I've literally got, got uh, two or three that uh, I can almost see from from the back of my garden as I'm as I'm uh, speaking now. Um, so the cemeteries are are very much part of the battlefields, but the memorials that that are in between uh, the cemeteries are also you know very very moving and of course once you know the area well there are even individual memorials to, to individual people and I find that perhaps one of the most extraordinary aspects as we explore the battlefields these v- hidden away memorials to individuals created by their families uh, both French and uh, and and British um, uh, and for Brit- Britain of course I mean uh, the Empire as well so that aspect, it's the aspects of, of three different things, private memorials, the, the cemetery, small and, and large, all very beautifully cared for by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, uh, and then the memorials themselves. So it's, it's intermingling that. So then, of course, then the, the, the stops in the local bars and, and cafes and, and restaurants. So it's pulling all of that together. As we said, this is a special that's airing uh, to commemorate Remembrance Day. You're an ex-serviceman yourself, an ex-Royal Marine. What does Remembrance Day mean to you? 
Well, it's a time to reflect, and obviously, I'm reflecting on friends that uh, that I lost during my service, and my son served as well. So, friends that he lost. So, it's it's about reflection. It's about commemorating uh, uh, servicemen um, throughout whatever war. So, to me, it's a it's a big part of, of my life, actually. And in fact, I normally bring out my old green berry uh, and wear it during the, uh, during the services uh, because if I wasn't actually guiding and taking people around the battlefields. Then, then I would be at the local, my village war memorial, um, which I go to when I'm not working. And so the two years of COVID, that's where I paraded. I paraded uh, quietly on one because we weren't supposed to be there. Um, uh, but uh, to me, it's important. It's important that, that, that we make the effort to commemorate those men that uh, uh, fought and died for us at various times throughout history. And do you feel that link through the ages, Pete, from the, the men that you follow around the battlefields from the First World War all the way through to your modern era of service? Yeah, both ways, Matt. Actually, I feel it further back as well. So and I, I don't just guide uh, in this area on, on the First World Battlefields. I, I cover some of the Second War actions, and so so I cover that. But I also do Agincourt and Cressy guiding, and so and ridiculous. I know it may sound, but men still died there. So so yes, I I, I think of all periods when I'm uh, commemorating and uh, and remembering uh, the people that fell at the, at the War Memorial. And, and yes, I, I feel a link both backwards in history and and, uh, and forwards to you know to modern times to to men uh, fighting uh, uh, in the modern times as we're as we're speaking now so yeah it's uh, it's 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 part of my commemoration one of the things we know about france pete and that battlefield area is there are some very strong connections between french communities and the australians who saved them in the first world war a century ago places like villas bretno where the australian national memorial is Fromel, where so many Australians fell, uh, Pozier, the most costly battle in Australia's military history. All of these small communities have not forgotten the Australians. What do you think Remembrance Day means to the local French people, particularly those people who live right in the heart of the battlefields? Yeah, well, co- commemoration is is the same worldwide. Not everybody becomes uh, in, involved, um, and there is this Australian connection to many places, uh, Bulcor, uh, Corby, two others uh, that I could add, add to the list where there's a, a a direct link, and people will be aware of that. That to go and stand uh, by the war memorial, and over the years, I must say, I paraded in the most appalling weather. Sometimes it tends to be one of those. Uh, uh, November the eleventh is a is a day that we can get terrible weather, but it's um uh, but it's yeah it's uh, I I think being there uh, is, is important no matter what the weather, uh, and and you will get the hardy local people out there and it's it's something that young people go to as well because it is a public holiday so you get the young people will uh, will, will will go there as well very often uh, learning for the first time uh, about Australians uh, and British and whoever Americans uh, who who perhaps had, had fought through or in their their town or village so yeah it's 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 part of of life r- rural life or town life in this area well it's a wonderful reception we get as australians in those villages of france and i can't wait to get back over there next year and uh, walk the ground with you again pete and uh, and experience it firsthand but thank you very much for joining us today to share your thoughts about remembrance day no it's a pleasure Matt. So it's, it's been nice chatting Remembrance Day isn't about commemorating just the First World War or even the Second World War. There are a number of recent conflicts which also are very significant on Remembrance Day, particularly to those veterans who are still with us. And one of the most controversial of those recent conflicts was the war in Vietnam. It was a very difficult war for the 50,000 Australians who fought in it. Many of the men and women that went over there didn't quite understand why they were fighting that war. And of course, many of them were conscripts who had no choice but to go and fight over there. It took a long time for Australia to come to terms with our relationship with the Vietnam War. And today it is a destination that does welcome visitors, both veterans and simply people who are interested in that wartime history. And one of the men who leads tours for us is a veteran. One of the few tours we have escorted by a veteran. He's a military cross recipient, He was wounded during the Vietnam War as a platoon commander, and I'd like to welcome him now. It's former Lieutenant Colonel Gary Mackay. Gary, thanks very much for joining us uh, for this Remembrance Day special. You're welcome, Matt. It's pretty special to us, mate, that 
you lead tours to Vietnam, and this is the only destination where we have veterans who are still walking the ground. Is that significant to you, the fact that you can keep going back to Vietnam all these years after the war? It is, and it's special um, because it gives me the opportunity to, you know, give a first-hand account of what it was like. Uh, and and it's nothing that I you can read in a book. It's actually, you know, how I felt, what I experienced, and uh, and that's what I try and do when I take veterans back on the tours. I get them to share their story as well, which I think is pretty special to the people on the tour. You served in some pretty... Um some pretty horrific conflicts over there, mate. I mean, just just in a, a few short words, can you just give us a very quick overview of your service in Vietnam? Yeah, I uh, I deployed with the 4th Battalion, the Royal Australian Regiment, which was an Anzac battalion. So we had a company of Kiwis with us. And uh, primarily our role was to search for and destroy the enemy uh, in Phuc Thuy province. Because the task force had been reduced to two infantry battalions, we spent most of our time in the scrub. And so consequently, uh, we would be out for four or five, six weeks, back for five days and then back out again. So it was a non-stop patrol interspersed with five days of rehydrating in, in the boozer. But but it was a war in the shadows for us. It was mainly at platoon level, uh, where contacts were at very short ranges, usually less than a cricket pitch. And uh, it was a war in the shadows. It was, for a lot of the time, it was just a hard grind. And then every now and then we'd have moments of absolute terror when we got into heavy battle. Must have been hard, mate, the first time you went back over there and walked that ground again and, and saw your former enemies up close. I mean, how has that changed over the years as you've been going back more and more often? Oh, absolutely. Uh, when I first went back in 83, 84, um, it, it was still under embargo. Um, Thompson at airport in Saigon was manned by security people who looked like the North Vietnamese that I'd last seen in 1971. Um, the place was struggling. And um, thankfully, uh, ever since Bill Clinton lifted the embargo and tourism started injecting some serious cash into the economy, um, Vietnam has really gone ahead. And I'm glad to say that it's now a very progressive country, albeit socialist by politic and communist by ideology. It really is a capitalist country. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to go back. It's one of my favourite places to visit and just, you know, beyond the battlefield experience, the people are wonderful, the food is amazing, the, the landscape is incredible and the history a very long and proud history is is just remarkable so it really is a, a wonderful destination to visit in general isn't it no oh, it is you know uh, you, you summed it all up you know and the, and the people are what make it they are they're great people you know i've had the opportunity to meet my former enemy and uh sit down and have a beer with them and uh yeah they're just a great bunch of people What's the relationship like with your former enemies over there now, veterans who served on the other side? What's the relationship like when Australian veterans come over to visit the former battlefields? Well, for, for the people on my tour who I'm taking back for the first time, they're, they're quite apprehensive, but it doesn't take long for them to realise that the enemy have no animosity or anger uh, toward us. As a matter of fact, there's a... Almost a camaraderie of like, uh, well, we're brothers in arms. We both made it through. And I think that's the strong point of it, that uh, because Australians fought with honour, I think, um, 
as one former North Vietnamese said to me, uh, we didn't commit atrocities. We buried their dead, we took care of their wounded, and we tried to do something for the people of the province. So there's a lot of respect for the way we conducted our war. And I think that's that goes a long way to the way we're treated. When I was over there with you in 2016, we were in the presidential palace and we ran into a group of North Vietnamese veterans and they instantly recognised our group as containing veterans as well. And it was a pretty touching moment for me, mate, a little unexpected, but very touching. They came over and formed a line and shook hands with all the Australian veterans. But I got the impression that wasn't an unusual mm. feature of life in Vietnam today. No, no. Uh, you might remember when we went up the long high hills that climb up to the top where the Buddhist monk lives. Um, I was going up there one day and there were a whole bunch of veterans from D445 battalion having a, a barbecue on the side of the track. And when I was going up, they asked who we were, we told them. So they wanted us to share their cook chook and, and a gold beard. Um, and, and they'd lugged it all the way up the hill and, uh, we had a beer, saluted each other and we were on our way. It was, fa- it was fantastic. What's the experience like walking those battlefields, not just for you as a veteran and for other veterans, but also people who might not have fought during the war? Because we always want those tangible connections with history. That's, that's why we go and walk battlefields. Can you just talk us through a little bit about what there still is to see in Vietnam and ways that we can connect with the history? Yeah, well, I think, Matt, we're pretty lucky. Uh, the Most of the battlefields are pretty much as they were during the American War. Um, the vegetation changes because, for example, at Long Tan, um, what used to be a rubber plantation has now been supplanted by uh, the last time I was there before COVID. Uh, it was bananas, and in between the banana rows, they were growing corn. Uh, so it all changes. Um, the battlefields at Coral and Balmoral are still in the rubber, um, and some of the other battlefields are pretty much still in the bush, pretty much as it was. Um, all that's really changed is the mode of transport Instead of going down a, a single lane gravel or bitumen road, it's now more likely to be a four lane motorway uh, that now connects most of the major places. There's also a lot of museums and sites to see where there's relics left over from the fighting. And I know we have to be careful about these because obviously they're, they're now displayed in a way that promotes the North Vietnamese cause. Um, but it's good to see relics. It's good to be able to touch and feel items that were used during the war, that really enhances the experience. Yeah, it's funny. You know, uh, in Australia, you go to a local park, you're likely to see a steam tractor or a, an old uh, Massey Ferguson on the corner of the park. In, in Vietnam, you're going to see either an artillery piece or a helicopter uh, as a relic. I mean, and they're just everywhere. You know, you yourself have been to the, the, res- uh, the Reunification Palace and we've seen tanks and all sorts of weaponry. Uh, and at the and at the museum, the main museum in Saigon, it's much the same. It's a good place to go to see this is what people actually used on the field of battle. And it, and it's everywhere, even up on the DMZ uh, at the at the old border crossing point. There are some pretty good reminders of what went on. Well, mate, we're having this conversation around Remembrance Day and the nature of Remembrance Day has changed a lot over the years. Obviously, originally it was to commemorate the end of the First World War, but now, in some ways, sadly, it's grown to also include all those other wars, including Vietnam, of course. As a veteran, as someone who's trod the ground and laid in the mud and felt the bullets flying overhead, what does that, what does that word Remembrance mean to you? What does Remembrance Day mean to you? You know, Matt, it gives me a chance to just pause and reflect uh, about the men that I lost here on the field of battle and also to remember the guys from my platoon 
and being a platoon commander, uh, who's passed away since we returned to Australia from Vietnam. And it, but it also allows me to pay a bit of respect to everybody who's ever pulled on the uniform, regardless of service, and who've done their bit, and especially those heroes who never made it home. Um, I think that's what it, it's, it, it gives me another chance to honour those who served. Well, it's very well said, mate, and it was absolutely one of the highlights of my uh, my recent years to get over there and walk the ground with you. So I hope to uh, do it again before too long. And in the meantime, Gary, just thank you for joining us and, and sharing your thoughts on this special day. No, my pleasure, Matt. When we think about walking the battlefields, there's a couple of obvious destinations that spring to mind, such as Gallipoli and the Western Front and even more recently Vietnam. But there are a number of other sites around the world where Australians fought or where Australians sacrificed that are very significant to visit, to walk the ground and to learn these stories. And one of those is the Thai Burma Railway, the horrific story of Australians forced into labour building a railway for the Japanese whilst in captivity. Just a probably the most horrific chapter of Australia's Second World War story. And today there are a number of sites to see in Thailand, particularly at a place called Hellfire Pass, which really helps to bring us an understanding of what those men endured during all those years of captivity. And it's a sombre place to visit, but it's a very important place to visit. And to tell us all about it is battlefield historian David Howell. David, thanks very much for joining us on this special day. Now, you are overseas, uh, but you're not actually in Thailand, which is what we're going to be talking about. Where are you coming to us from now? Thanks, Matt. I'm coming from Port Moresby, capital of Papua New Guinea, just two days after the um, 80th anniversary of the Kokoda campaign. How was that, mate? It must have been pretty special to be up in the hills where this famous history unfolded, actually commemorating the anniversary of, uh, of, that, uh, of, of that Kokoda campaign. It was by far the um, most uh, well-turned-out uh, 80th an- uh, sorry, anniversary. I was there for the 75th and the 70th anniversary, but the 80th anniversary, they had a lot of input from DVA, from Defence, from the Australian Government, um, and it's great to see. They reopened uh, the Burt Kienzel Museum. Um, they had the original flag that was raised 80 years to the day um, by the troops on the 3rd of November, 1942, came up. So... And there probably would have been around about 400 Australians in attendance, which if you put in perspective, you're in the middle of nowhere. That's that's something, you know. It's fantastic, mate. I mean, you used to work at the Shrine in Melbourne. I mean, World War II, particularly the war in the Pacific, is pretty much your life. I know that you've got a wonderful collection of, of items from the Second World War. You spoke to a lot of veterans and you still speak to the handful that are left. How much does that experience of being able to talk to veterans enhance your understanding of the history? I think it does two things. At first, it shapes the way I look at it because, um, you know, you when you have the opportunity to speak to the veteran, you're getting an insight into how they feel and, you know, that they have gone through it. So their um, reflections, you know, now in this case, 80 years after the day is, has shaped their entire life but also their family's life. So when you talk to them and you then overlap that experience of getting to know the veterans with your own pilgrimage and commemoration, I think it makes it something that's tangible, something that you can touch, you can feel. And for me, the biggest thing is knowing that um, that why we do these things, why do we do remembrance, why do we do pilgrimages? And it's because it means something. There are still people alive, whether it's a veteran or their family, that have been shaped by these, um, you know, huge instances in history and for me, anyway, I think that reminds me of why it is so important. And when, and a lot of them have passed on now, of course, Matt, but when I'm at these commemorations, I think about those guys that I spoke to. I think about the conversations we had. But most importantly, I think about what it must have been like for them to go and attend a Remembrance Day service or a major commemorative service and reflect on their time. And these are the guys, remember, who made it through because obviously people who perish, their friends, et cetera, th- those guys aren't here and they've lived with that legacy uh, and it's a special thing. And now as we reach that point in time where World War II veterans unfortunately are 
uh, not as thick on the ground as they used to be. And there'll come a time like the First World War veterans when they're not here. I think every time I spend with them is precious and you now have an obligation to perpetuate their memory and most importantly, the memory of, I guess, their mates. Well, speaking of that memory, there's nothing more significant than the men who died on the Thai Burma Railway. I think it's probably the darkest chapter of Australia's Second World War story. And what does that mean, being able to walk that ground in Thailand at Hellfire Pass, where these men laboured and where so many of them died? Well, you're right, Matt, that this particular chapter of Australian military history, a very dark chapter, and it's, for me... um, the first thing that comes to mind is the the day-to-day suffering, the, the just living in those conditions. Um, as you know, I'm coming from your PNG, but going to Thailand, it does share something in common, and that is that you have a jungle environment, you have humidity, but you've got all the stuff that goes with it, beriberi, dysentery, malaria, all of these things which you have to contend with, and you're being forced, in this case, in Burma Thai Railway, forced labour, living in horrible conditions, very little food, very little energy. And, you know, for me, being on that ground, even though it's, you know, 80 odd years later, uh, you you can't help but feel the hairs on the back of your neck stand up because you're in a place where there are marks in the rock, for example. There are marks where men with picks toiled and their imprint is there in time. You know, it's there and you can see it, you can touch it, you can feel it. And to me, you know, it cast my mind back to, uh, we were talking about veterans earlier. I had a wonderful uh, friendship with at the shrine with a guy named Charles Edwards who had been captured very early on. He was amongst some of the um, very first uh, Australian soldiers who taken POW on the Malay Peninsula. Obviously went to Singapore to Changi and worked on the, Burma Thai Railway and the only thing that saved him is that he had a skill and that he was a baker before the war and and again you know he's someone that survived had a horrible time but I sat with him at the shrine walked around the shrine and he told me all of these stories but the one thing that stuck out is that you know they're in a prison they don't have food they're suffering from all those tropical diseases and they have to work and if you don't work you perish and uh, like like 3,000 odd Australians did. So to put it back in perspective, when you're on the ground and you can see the marks in the in the rock from where these guys were working, um, it is probably in that aspect unique uh, more so than a lot of other Australian battlefields because you can reach out and touch um, an imprint in a rock that somebody made under these extraordinary conditions. How important is that as an experience, David? Because occasionally I get asked, you know, why do we visit a battlefield? Why don't we just read a book or watch a documentary or listen to an interview like this one? Why do we actually have to walk the ground? So how important are those tangibles and those reminders of the war? Well, for me, it's paramount. You can read the books. You can um, you can listen to interviews, plenty of podcasts, YouTube, all that sort of stuff. But and I think you need to do that too. I think that's part of it. But when you're there on the ground, you, you can't beat that. You you are uh, able to literally be on the place where it happened. And I'm not suggesting that it's spiritual or anything like that. But for me, it is, you know, being, I guess, completely consumed in the environment. And we cannot, re- we cannot reproduce the environment, the lay of the land, as I mentioned with in this particular battlefield with etchings from, uh, you know, not etchings, but, you know, imprints into rocks. Um, the, 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 the landscape has changed through, through people, um, you know, toiling away. And when you're there, you can still see it and you can feel it. And that is something that you can't get out of a history book. You, you, you couldn't, you can't, um, you can't experience, no, not the greatest orator in history would, yeah, they can conjure up the ideas, but until you see it yourself, uh, until you've been there, and you had their hairs on the back of your neck stand up, you reach out, you touch the earth, you touch the stone in this case. Um, you know, no book, no podcast, no YouTube is ever going to be able to replicate that. Um, and it's very important, I think, in undertaking, especially for Australians to undertake a pilgrimage, that's what it is. These are our pilgrimages to these extraordinary events in history. We go there, we visit it, and, yeah, you can come back, read the books and that, but being there... Uh, it is a memory of every battlefield I've been to 
uh, you know, that memory stays with me more so than you can revisit the, the YouTubes and the books over and over again. But to have that experience, for me, in my mind, you can't replicate it and you have to do it. You have to go there. I could tell you intimately on all different battlefields, but you can't just take my word for it. You have to go there. You have to reach out. You have to touch it. And I think that completes, in some sense, the circle of, you know, hearing the stories, reading the books, and when you're there on the ground. Uh, and it puts a different perspective because the other thing to remember when you take a pilgrimage and go and visit a battlefield is that um, the image that you form in your head from hearing stories or from reading words in a page may be very different than when you actually get there. And one thing that strikes me is that um, sometimes the areas which are described are actually much smaller than what you picture them in your mind. Uh, and especially in this case with Burma Thai Railway, you, you realise where, you know, thousands of um, uh, civilians and allied prisoners worked in these conditions. And, um, you know, it's you see the confines of the space, you see the, the enormity of the, um, the challenge that they had. I mean, you know, in this case, clearing sheer rock out to make a, a pass for um, trains to go through. And, you know, it's not like they had modern day um, power tools and all that sort of stuff. They were doing it by hand. It was almost medieval in a sense. So, you know, seeing that and being on the battlefield and putting that in perspective, uh, to my mind, is something that, uh, even if you only go to one battlefield in your life as a pilgrimage um, to remember, uh, for this I'm talking obviously from the Australian um, perspective, you need to do it. You need to be able to um, see where these events happened. And then, of course, when you visit a cemetery, Commonwealth Wargrave Cemetery, especially after, I, I, I like to go and see the battlefield and then go and pay the respects in the cemetery. And you, um, it, I think it all comes full circle and uh, I just yeah I just think that going to a battlefield uh, completes a circle well you're going to be leading a, a bunch of our dear passengers over there for Anzac day how how much more special is walking this ground around the time of one of those great commemorative events I mean we're coming to you around remembrance day but obviously Anzac day is our big day of the year how much more special is it to walk the ground for Anzac day I think that Anzac Day, and you know, let's put it in the context of it. You know, Gallipoli created the, the creation of the Anzac legend, the, the, the commemorations that have moved on from that time. I think, you know, one thing that's very interesting for a start. Obviously, we associate Anzac Day with a dawn service. I've just done a, a pilgrimage in the jungles of New Guinea. We did a dawn service prior to the major commemorations. We do that because, as Australians, that's the birth of. The idea of Anzac and and remembrance and and I think that when you're at an Australian battlefield, no matter what battlefield it is, whether First Second World War, Vietnam, etc., on a, on a day like Anzac Day, the day of days to remember all Australian service and sacrifice, has that extra, uh, um, I guess, emotional uh, connection because it is the day where we remember everybody, and to do it on a battlefield um is just something that you um you can't re replace and from the australian perspective i'm sure the kiwis as well but if you are an australian and you go to a battlefield for a dawn service on anzac day you cannot get any closer than that because the idea of remembrance the last post sounding hearing the words of the ode you are completely in the moment and um I just think that um, that Anzac Day is that special time. It's almost like, um, you know, uh, you're only going to get this. Most people may not may go to several battlefields and they may not do it on Anzac Day every time. They may only go once on Anzac Day. But if you're going to go to a battlefield and you get the opportunity to do it on Anzac Day, the Day of Days, I think, just um, has such uh, an emotional connection that you cannot replicate anywhere else. We talked earlier about going and visiting the ground, reading something in a book, go visit the ground, do it on Anzac Day, dawn service, commemoration, all of it ties in together. And, um, you know, look, after 20 odd years doing these sorts of things, I still, Anzac Day is the day where the, the, the salt water wells in my eyes, you know. Well, it is Remembrance Day coming up and you are an ex-serviceman yourself. What, what does that word 
remembrance mean to you? What does the day mean to you? Well, for me personally, uh, you know, uh, rem remembrance, um, I, I don't look so much of my own service. I think we, as human beings, sometimes always neglect ourselves. But when I have Remembrance Day, I think of all the veterans that I've spoken to, mainly Second World War guys, and most of them are, I mean, there's only a handful left now, they're gone. But I remember them. I remember talking to them. Yeah, they were old, older men, you know, but um, not as old as what the ones that are left now. But, you know, I remember being with them. I remember hearing their stories. And, um, you know, one of the things that are, I guess, sad now is that a lot of these guys that I've interviewed, as I said, have passed or, or they're not in their own home anymore. But, you know, every Remembrance Day, I remember a handful of veterans that I would go and visit. Um, and, you know, they'd be the same you know, that the house was last upgraded in the 1970s. Everything was neat. You would have a, a, a ham and ham and salad lunch with a cup of tea and a, and, a, and a piece of Boston cake or bun at the end of it. And you'd hear these stories. And there's this common theme of humility. And, um, you know, it was never about me. It was about my mates. And I, I guess I try and think now on Remembrance Day, um, you know, what was their sacrifice for? I mean, I volunteered, but I wasn't caught up in major events like the second world war but you realize that you could be you could have been it could have been your generation and so if you for me remembrance day is i know it's cliche but if we don't remember the past then we are doomed to repeat it and um you know we need to take time out and take check of the situation and remember those guys who just happened to unfortunately be their generation that got caught up in this well david we're very lucky to have you on the team giving your insights into particularly the Second World War and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule in New Guinea uh, to talk to us uh, on Remembrance Day. No worries. Thanks very much, Matt. Thank you for joining us for this very special Remembrance Day event. It's a very important day, Remembrance Day, but sometimes it gets a little bit overshadowed because of the significance of Anzac Day in April. But obviously by joining us today, you've demonstrated you haven't forgotten what it means to stop and remember on November 11, all of those men and women who fought and died for Australia. So I hope to see you out there on the battlefields. I hope to see you online in some form talking about our very proud Anzac history. In the meantime, thank you very much for joining us.